Welcome to the International Speech Contest for District 47. I am Distinguished Toastmaster Tora Cole, and I am honored to serve as your contest master. Speech contests are a Toastmasters tradition. Each year, thousands of Toastmasters compete at, in the humorous evaluation, table topics, and international speech contests. Competition begins with a club contest, and winners continue competing through the area, division, and district levels. Winners of the district level international speech contest proceed to the region quarterfinal level. Following region quarterfinals, winners advance to the semifinals for a chance to take part in the world championship of public speaking. Do we have a world champion with us today? We certainly believe we do. The purpose of the International Speech Contest is to provide an opportunity to learn by observing the more proficient speakers who have benefited from their Toastmasters training and to recognize the best as encouragement to all. Contestants have drawn their speaking positions. The order is contestant number one, Michael McQuillan. Contestant number two, Anthony Serial. Contestant number three, C.C. Espute, contestant number four, Janine Kinsey, contestant number five, Monifa Lang Stewart, contestant number six, Alfreda Gibson, contestant number seven, Anastasia Palacios. Again, the order is Michael McQuillan, Anthony Serial, C.C. Espute, Janine Kinsey, Monifa Lang Stewart, Alfreda Gibson, Anastasia Palacios. Contestant number one, Michael McQuillan, the Macarena Baby. Macarena Baby, Michael McQuillan. I have seen the sunrise over Machu Picchu, and I've seen the Grand Canyon under a full moon. I've got heat cramps in the Mojave Desert and frostbite in Alaska. I've appeared on the local news, and I've set a world record. And I owe it all to goal setting and the fact that I do not set goals, at least not anymore. Now, if you want to lecture me and say, Mike, you need to set goals in your life, trust me, you have to wait in a very long line family, people I don't even know. Even my childhood heroes got in on the action. That's right. If you go on YouTube, not now, and type in the speech that broke the internet, you'll find Arnold Schwarzenegger saying, without a destination in mind, or, or go the where to go, you just drift around, never end up anywhere. Is he wrong? No. He's the Terminator. If you're a bodybuilder or a time-traveling cyborg, then you have to set your objective and complete your destiny. But if you're a drifter, like I am, or if you're an artist, like I'm not, then you don't complete a destiny. You create one. Now, I poke fun at Arnold because I'm a huge fan. It was the action heroes and the pro athletes of the 1980s who inspired me growing up to set the goals that I have set in my life, including one when I said, someday, I want to set a world record. And you heard from the introduction, I did it. At Yankee Stadium, along with 51,000 of my fellow baseball fans, we set the record for the world's largest group dance when we did the Macarena. Remember back in the 90s when the Macarena was everywhere? It turns out we were totally doing it wrong. It's supposed to be loose and free, like sing it. We were doing it kind of like the Terminator. Don't even waste your time doing stupid dances unless you can set the world record while you're doing it. Macarena. Baby. I 
destiny complete. I set that goal and it lasted me the rest of my teenage years. When I set that record, it lasted the rest of the month. So much for goal setting. September 1st, 1996, at the crossroads of America, the Indiana State Fair, 60,000 Hoosiers conspired to break my world record by dancing the funky chicken. My dream was crushed. I never chased another world record after that, but I never stopped dancing either. When I think of my early adulthood, I think of that classic job interview question, where do you see yourself in five years? I never get that one right. Less than a week after the Hoosier Gate scandal, my next dance move was a right face and a forward march onto Marine Corps boot camp, expecting to live my life walking a straight and narrow path. But somewhere, in between the yellow footprints of Paris Island and the burning sands of the California desert, I discovered my wanderlust. I grew up on Long Island, New York. I thought I was at the center of the universe. Turns out I didn't know anything. I said, I want to see places, and I don't want to know before I go. And that's why five years after I joined the Marines, somewhere between the midnight sun and the northern lights of Alaska, I discovered... Toastmasters, international, and when you talk as much as I do, you need two languages. And that's why five years after I moved out of Alaska, somewhere along the shores of Lake Titicaca, I found my wife. She taught me how to macarena, baby. And that's why right now I'm talking to you from my living room in Lima, Peru. As for the next five years, I have no idea. What do you think? Should I write down my goals? That works. By the way, we have a little time here. One day I woke up and I said, you know something? I need a small marker board. I walked out of my house. Somebody came walking down the street with these signs tied to his body. I bought one. I went back in the house. You know why? Because that's how I roll. Sometimes you just have to give yourself up to the universe. Whatever you believe in, we all pray under the same sky. But it turns out Arnold was right. If you don't have a pinpoint destination or a specific goal of where to go, then you can just drift around, never end up anywhere. Now that sounds like paradise. Now listen, if you spend your life pursuing tangible, worthwhile goals, I respect that, and I'm rooting for you. I'm your biggest fan, but please promise me that you will never clip anybody's wings or crush their dream by imposing a rigid standard of what life is supposed to be. Some people complete a destiny. Others create one. If you don't have a vision for the next five years of your life, consider yourself lucky. Just live for the moment with all of your passion, and your destiny will find you. In the meantime, do right by the good people in your life. Take good care of your health and dance like nobody's watching. Macarena, baby. Madam Contest Chair. Contestant number two, Anthony Serial. Stop the nothing. Stop the nothing. Anthony Serial. Contest chair, dignitaries, fellow Toastmasters. Have you ever come across someone who thinks they know everything? Maybe you went to school with them, maybe you worked with them, maybe you dated them, maybe. You are one of them? Don't worry. 
I'm not one of those people. If Toastmasters has taught me anything, it's talk about what you know, and I know a whole lot about nothing. I am the self-proclaimed expert on the subject of nothing. I came into the world with nothing and still have most of it left. You see, I am quite familiar with the concept of nothing because when I see a complete stranger and I want so badly to say hello and introduce myself and to, to talk to them, I stay silent and say nothing. When I see someone being victimized and feel compelled to do something to help out, I freeze and do nothing. Knowing the worst thing you can do in any situation is nothing. The nothing scares me. The fear that I would have lived my life for nothing. You see, my parents taught me to fear nothing, and it worked. I'm terrified of it. Do any of you share that fear? The fear that you would live for nothing, die for nothing, be known for nothing? I think many of us have experienced that. And yet, when you look at the way that we live our days, when you look at the way that we spend our money, we oftentimes will choose nothing over anything at an alarming rate and expense. For instance, tropical vacations promise for hundreds if not thousands of dollars that you can lay on the sand for days and do nothing. Billions of dollars spent every year on toxic pills and poisonous liquids that we ingest so that we can feel nothing. We take to social media. My heart goes out to, my thoughts and prayers are with, but what do we actually offer people in pain, people in need? Nothing. We shop at one massive store instead of several smaller stores. We pay for others to do what we're more than capable of doing ourselves. We drive on the highway at death-defying speeds, risking our lives and everyone else's, and we do these things so we have as much time left in our day to do nothing. I mean, I get it. I get it. Long day, long week, and sometimes all you want to do is hurry home, find the comfiest spot, nestle in, and just do nothing. It feels good. It feels good sometimes to just do nothing until it just doesn't. You can't enjoy the relaxation. You can't enjoy the nothing because your mind starts to get filled with the people you haven't spoken to, the things you haven't done, the plans that you canceled. You see, sometimes we choose nothing because it seems like it costs the least. But actually, sometimes doing nothing ends up costing everything. For instance, right now bookstores are closing and the libraries are empty. The Postal Service is suffering because instead of beautiful letters filling our mailbox, pen, paper, and emotions, we are sending texts, tweets, and emojis. Small businesses are closing their doors in less than a year of opening. Some childhood dream comes to fruition, but without support, the dream becomes a nightmare. You see, sometimes doing nothing costs everything. And I'm not here to point fingers. But let's be honest. Wanting things to change without taking some level of personal accountability is like calling the fire department to put out a fire, but never giving them an address. We live in a time thousands died to give us. 
And we choose, we choose far too often nothing. I watch, as many of you do, as the world starts to change, fewer and fewer options, fewer and fewer relationships. And I wonder how much longer can we continue to do nothing? But whether there comes a point when there's nothing left that we can do. And look, it's not all doom and gloom because nothing can work so beautifully if you just know how to use it. You see, if you claim to be nothing within that moment, you are allowing the possibility to be anything because you're not taking your fears and your anxieties and your negative habits, you're not taking them from yesterday and bringing them into tomorrow. You can let that go. If you claim to know nothing, then the book that represents your life still has empty pages to be incredible, beautiful knowledge and wisdom. Now, this is the point of the speech where I'm supposed to give you all to action. So here it is. Stop doing nothing. Stop paying for absolutely nothing. Reach out to the people you know, love, and care for. See the opportunity to be present. Listen, wherever you go, be there. Take this speech as a warning, if you will. Allow it to change the way that you interact with people in a more positive manner. So much so that they'll ask, what did it take to cause this beautiful change in how you are? And when they ask you, you can actually tell them it took nothing. Because either we realize it takes nothing to make the world better, or the nothing takes everything. Contest chair. Thank you. Contestant number three, Cece Espute, a second chance, a second chance, Cece Espute. Have you ever wanted, like, no, no, really needed a second chance? Madam Contest Master, I am a former U.S. Marine. But I'm also a former inmate. And right about now, somebody is saying, what did she say? Did she say playmate? And yes, while I like to think I could have been a playmate, I actually did say inmate. Many years ago, I made some poor choices, some bad decisions that ended my military career. And I ended up in prison for drug conspiracy. I spent 23 hours a day in a cell by myself in solitary confinement for almost a year. And then one day on April 1st, a guard opened up the gate and said, pack your stuff, you're leaving. Are you kidding me? It's April Fool's. I'm not going anywhere. And he was like, no, you really do have to leave. And I sat there afraid, afraid to leave my cell where I had felt comfortable because was he playing a trick on me? Was this a cruel joke? Finally, I did step out of that cell. And as I walked down that long corridor, my heart was racing and the emotions were coming up because at any point, I expected somebody to say, April Fools. 
And then as I stepped through another doorway, a guard very pleasantly said to me, see you soon. Now, back then, my hair was really, really big. And I was like, what? Are you coming to Miami to visit me? She was like, no. No. Why would I do that when 96% of all inmates violate their probation and come back to prison within the first year? Wait. If 96% come back, what happens to the other 4%? Could I be a part of that 4% who never comes back to prison? And suddenly I was excited because now I had a choice. Now I knew that I had a second chance. According to a Department of Justice survey, it says that one out of every three Americans has a criminal record. So look to your left, look to your right. One of the three of you has ridden in the back of a police car. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if it's not you, it's a parent, a sibling, a spouse, or a loved one. But my question to you is this. Do you have to ride in the back of a police car to rate a second chance? What types of life situations might warrant a second chance? Could it be a failed business, a messy divorce, or even a life-threatening illness? Have you ever experienced any of these? And if you did, what did you do? Did you sit by yourself in a cell, a mental cell, and do nothing? Did you look around and wonder, what next? Author Jill Davis said it best. Second chances are like trains and buses. They come regularly and depart. And your job is to know which bus or train or second chance to take to get you where you want to go. Because we may never meet in person. We may never have the chance to sit down and talk, but I promise you this. If you take a second chance, if you step out of that cell, great things await you out there. You'd be amazed at what life is offering you. The second chance to start a new business, to fall in love again, and improve your health. Take that second chance. You'll be amazed at the things that are out there for you. Madam Contest Master. Contestant number four, Janine Kinsey, Blind Faith, Blind Faith, Janine Kinsey. When I was just a few days old, my mother went to my father and said, Jim, there is something wrong with Janine's eyes. I think we need to take her to the eye doctor. So they did. And after extensive testing, the doctor, the doctor said, the, after several minutes, the doctor came in and said, I'm sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Cooney, to tell you that your daughter is completely blind. She will never be able to see the difference between light and dark. Madam Contest Master, fellow Toastmasters, 
What would you do? My parents sat there for a few moments stunned and said, what is there something, what if there's something we could do? What would we be able to do to help her see? The doctor said, you don't understand. It's not physically possible for her to see. My mother was determined. She said, but there has to be something we can do. At this point, the doctor realized that my parents were going to be operating on blind faith, and my mother wasn't going to take no for an answer. He thought about it for a couple of minutes, and he finally said, if anything's going to help, maybe the color red will stimulate her vision, but no promises. So my parents took me home, and they redecorated the nursery. All of the toys were brightly colored. They had textures. They made sounds. And the nursery was repainted the brightest red you can imagine. It was, it was the color of Ronald McDonald's hair. It was bright. The state commission decided that my parents needed help raising a blind child, so they sent a caseworker over to the house. She <laughs> bustled in. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Cooney, I just want you to understand that you're raising a blind child. So there's three things I want you to know. Number one, you need to get a playpen, and she needs to always be in that playpen so she's safe. Number two, you need to never rearrange the furniture because when she does start moving around, she needs to know exactly where things are. And number three, you need to learn Braille. And she bustled out the door and left. That didn't make a lot of sense to my mom. She didn't, how do you raise a child to live in a sighted world if you put them in a box all the time? So there was no playpen. And while she didn't deliberately rearrange the furniture, if something moved, it moved. She did learn a little bit of Braille, just in case. Over time, people would come over to the house now, Shirley, it must be so hard raising a blind child. I don't know how you do it. My mother would look at him and say, actually, we're doing really well. But Janine has started crawling, so I need your help in a minute. When she comes in and I put her down, if you see her crawling towards something that might hurt her, please don't yell out or run over and catch her. Just trust me. They'd kind of give her a funny look, and she'd go get me and put me on the floor to play. And I would crawl around. And eventually I would head for something that might cause me a problem. And as I would get just up to it, the person was biting their tongue while my mother just grabbed a pillow that she kept handy and tossed it in front of me. And when I ran into the pillow, she'd go, uh oh, and I would turn around and giggle and keep going. People were amazed at how well we were doing. As I continued to move around, my mother began to notice that I aimed for doors and windows, which is very interesting for a child who supposedly can't see light and dark. So at 10 months, my mother took me back to the eye doctor. Janine can see. Mrs. Cooney, I told you, it is not physically possible for her to see. Your blind faith is making you see things that just aren't there. Fine. She put me on his desk, and she turned around and left the room. I'll be back in five minutes, she said. Over the next five minutes, I tore his desk apart, picking things up to look at him and bring him up close enough so I could see him. And when Mom finally came back in the room, he said, here, please take her. And as he put his desk back together, he said, you're right, she can see something. Don't Green light. And until she's five years old, there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. My mother looked at him. Can't you give her glasses? <laughs> Are you crazy? You can't put glasses on a baby. Have you ever gotten that look from your mother? 
You'll do just about anything to get out from under that look. And he did. We left with a prescription for a pair of glasses. And the parting shot. You'll never get her to wear them, though. Over the next month, we played with glasses, frames. Yellow light. They got my glasses ready to go. And when I was a year, about 11 months old, we walked back into the doctor's office. And their best guess at this point is that what I saw is about what you would see if you put a piece of wax paper over your eyes. Needless to say, I couldn't see really well. And I hung on to mom's hand as we walked into the office. They picked me up and they put me in that big chair. And then they put my glasses on. I could see there was a whole world out there. And when they finally let me out of that chair, I ran down the hall. Mom had to chase me to catch me. As for you'll never get her to wear them, I threw my first temper tantrum that night when she tried to take my glasses away from me. Fellow Toastmasters, my mother's blind faith took us from your daughter can never see to, but what can we do about it? Red light. To, she can see. What could a little blind faith do for you today? Thank you. Contestant number five, Monifa Lang Stewart. If it does not break you, it makes you. If it does not break you, it makes you. Monifa Lang Stewart. If it does not break you, it makes you. This is a tough and thought provoking affirmation. Have you ever thought that the tumultuous situations that attempted to destroy you could potentially build you up and help you to realize that you are stronger? than you can ever imagine. Indeed, life can throw some hard blows at times. These horrific knockouts can attack when we least expect it. The past three years have been, woo, a roller coaster ride. We. It has carried the undesirable and sudden drop that swooped me in a dark and isolated place. If this ride came with a warning or a disclaimer alert, I would have run as far as the east separates from the west. But unfortunately, and fortunately, we just don't know what lies around the bend in the race called life. The journey of grieving the loss of my precious mom, confident and best friend, has been a hurricane of great intensity. I found myself trapped in a whirlwind of dark emotions with despair and grief at the center of my inner commotion 
It seemed I had nothing left. I was a broken treble cleft. My world was filled with a dismal gloom. I fought to escape, but in my heart, only sadness bloomed. Can this possibly make me? At times I felt so broken. I never knew that I could pull through such a turbulent storm. At no point did I feel prepared, motivated, or strong. This one was just too much to bear. Paddling through deep waters, a weary traveler I had been. I'm sure I would have drowned quickly if God did not step in. I tapped into the resources of my friends and family, and that too helped tremendously. What is your storm? Today, I'm here to tell you that you are stronger than you think. I've come to realize that some challenges unfold God's will. The process can be brutally agonizing, but at some point, you'll experience growth. I've learned to Never take for granted the time I share with my friends and family. It pushes me to not procrastinate. And on the contrary, life experiences have shown me that it is never too late. Even my decision to become a member of Toastmasters has been a result of my grief-stricken journey. I was seeking to escape, and Kotlebe Toastmasters has provided a safe place for me. Fellow Toastmasters and guests, today I charge you to rise. Tesla Kalonji lyrically penned these words. Rise to the occasion, look at yourself and say that you are strong. Embrace your challenges as opportunities for exponential growth. The next time life serves you lemons, don't be dismayed. Instead, squeeze back as hard as you can and make lemonade of faith, determination, and success. Trust the process and pathway of your lives, and you will realize that if it does not break you, it makes you. Madam Contest Chair. Contestant number six, Alfreda Gibson. Memories of Big G. Memories of Big G. Alfreda Gibson. We all know it's coming for each and every one of us. It's coming. The problem is we don't know how, we don't know when, 
and it is something we are never prepared for. Contest chair, fellow Toastmasters, and anyone who's not quite ready for that day, good afternoon. In your quiet time, or any time for that matter, do you often sit and reminisce about a loved one that's no longer with you? I know I do. I do a lot. I find myself constantly thinking about my grandmother. She was a giant of a woman, small in stature, but big on everything else. She was a force to be reckoned with. Granny was also a little key thug. Big G, as my younger siblings like to call her, she could do everything and she wasn't afraid of anything. I was often amazed by what she was able to accomplish on her meager salary. She worked as a cook and a janitress for her adult working life, making minimum wage, but she was resourceful. So much so, she was able to purchase her own home, raise seven children by herself, and even help raise a few grandkids. Growing up, our house was always filled with people that she took care of. She made friends easily because of her kind and generous nature. But don't ever, do, don't ever mistake her kindness for weakness because she was not the one to play with. And she did not mince her words, letting you know that. I learned so much from her. And I always remember feeling so safe and so protected when she was around. I would never forget, there was an incident where we thought someone was trying to break into our house. It was late one evening, my two younger sisters, my older cousin and I, we were in the dining room when all of a sudden, the window screen just popped out of place. I stopped, stared, looking at each other. My cousin tried to ease the tension by saying, oh, it's probably just a cat. I kept my eyes glued to that spot, hoping and praying that a cat would poke its head through. Not so lucky. What I saw instead was a dirty, gloved hand reaching its way through the opening. My eyes widened and I screamed, run! Someone's trying to break into the house! We all dashed into the hallway, making a beeline for Big G's room. Well, everyone except for my baby sister, she was paralyzed with fear. I was already in the hallway out of harm's way, so I was begging with her to run, move, crawl, roll, do something, just get into the hallway. I was scared, but I couldn't leave her. I dashed back for her, grabbed her by the arm, and I dragged her behind me down the hallway. We all burst into Big G's room shouting, someone's trying to break into the house. Big G was sitting on her bed, reading her Bible like she normally does. She looked up and said, my house? The devil is a liar. Big G pounced off of her bed. I don't know where the weapons came from so fast, but before I knew it, we were all armed with something. After arming all of us, she ordered, let's go. <laughs> the fair I felt earlier, it just melted away. In that moment, I wasn't afraid of anything. Even my baby sister was walking with her chest puffed up. She even had an extra bounce in her step. You know, 
I also could have sworn that in Big G's younger years, she was in some sort of special ops because as we neared the dining room, she didn't even talk. She just motioned where she wanted everyone to position themselves. She motioned for us to remain inside while she went out. But we all dashed out when we heard screams. Oh no, I thought. Big G's in trouble. She needs us. Big G, my tenacious, hardworking, unselfish, gold smashing G, my thug. Not a day goes by I don't think about her or miss her. It's been more than 15 years since we lost her. Oh, no, we didn't lose her that night. Oh, no, that night she was victorious. We did lose her some years later to cancer. She fought long and she fought hard, but eventually she succumbed. Fellow Toastmasters, make sure you're spending time with people that matter to you because there will come a time when the only thing you have left are memories. Make sure they are memories that will make you smile and not memories that will make you wish. If only, if only I had spent more time making great memories. Contest chair. Contestant number seven, Anastasia Palacios. Are you in your race? Are you in your race? Anastasia Palacios. There are two types of people in the world. One got talks too much on every report card. Sound familiar? Well, they're the strong, silent type, but they walk through every task to completion. I call them the talkers and the walkers. And whether you are a talker or a walker, at some point, we have all been conformers. At some point, there was someone you wanted to impress or a job you really wanted or even a speech contest to win, and you've walked someone else's walk, talked someone else's talk, and even run someone else's race. If we are going to move from being conformers to transformers, we have to run our race. Contest chair. And anyone who knows they have potential, run your race. Speaking of running, I'm from a country where they do a lot of that. Do you know which country has won more Olympic medals than any other country? The Bahamas. Okay, when I talk about like any other country, I mean countries with a population under 1 million, but who's counting? We have a total medal count of 16. 14 of those are for running. So you would understand why all my life I wanted to run. I'm from the Bahamas. I grew up in the Bahamas. I bet you think I can run, right? Wrong. I spent 12 years of my life being picked last to run. <laughs> then... One day, I got the opportunity to run the 400 meters. <clears throat> I walked to the truck, thinking of the little engine that could. I think I can. 
I think I can. The gun goes off. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can, and I am doing it. I am running my race, and I can see just clouds in front of me with my head to the sky, and the angels are cheering me on. But I may need an angel because I can't bring it. <sighs> Down to 200. My side. Down to 100. Oh, my knees. And that's when I see her. Alexina's on my left. I start to look at her race. If I could just beat her pace, I can get, I think I can. I run faster. I think I can faster. I think I can. And I cross the finish line. Last. <laughs> I finished last. Well, the announcer said fourth place, but there were four of us. And as I reflected, I realized that I'd stopped running my race, watched Alexina's pace, and lost the race. Later that day, I get into my dad's car and he sees the fourth place ribbon. Baby doll, what's that for? I ran the 400 today. You did? Congratulations. Daddy, I came fourth. There were four of us, but you ran. Then he proceeds to take the evidence of my fourth place failure and hang it up on his rearview mirror for the world to see. I was so embarrassed. Have you ever given your all to something and still come up short? Daddy, why do you have that up there? Baby doll, you can never determine the outcome, but always run your race. Fast forward a few years of me conforming and walking other people's walks and take me back to my dad's car. I'm climbing in at this time, just looking for a trace of him. And I can smell the oak of his cologne and the sea breeze that he <laughs> smelled of. And I'm sitting in there because my biggest cheerleader has died. As I sit there, I see it. It's crusted with time, 1,970 days worth, but hanging from the rearview mirror is my fourth place ribbon. Now, I will never hear my dad start a pep talk with baby doll again, but in this moment, I hear it loud and clear. My race is done. Run your race. Toastmasters, yes, run your race when you are exhausted. Run your race when you are alone. Run your race even when people disagree with your direction. Run your race so that whether you come in first, second, or fourth, Someone can say, at least you ran. How do we move from conformers to transformers? It's time to take up space. Find your lane, go at your pace, and whether you win or you come in fourth place, today I declare you will run your race. Contest chair.
So great job again, once again. Let's congratulate our contestants. Show them some love. On behalf of District 47, I would like to thank all of our functionaries. Everyone did a fantastic job. Those of you working behind the screens, you know this was a quite a task. So again, congratulations to our contest co-chairs for pulling this together to our judges and to all of our functionaries, I want to say thank you. Your time and help have been invaluable in making this contest a success. It has been my pleasure to be your contest master today. And on behalf of the entire contest team and all of our contestants, thank you for joining us. And again, we hope that you've enjoyed this contest. Enjoy your weekend and enjoy the rest of the day. Stay blessed.